yeah, I mean, just work to try to get better every single day. You know, I mean, definitely excited about returning experience, but we got to develop uh, a fifth starter. We have to develop depth. We have to develop competition. So at the end of the day, there's a lot of work to be done still. But of course, it's great to have experience coming back. But isn't that like how they build it from the from the front out? Uh, and just having that kind of experience, Ben Petrula, Alec Lindstrom, Tyler Vrabel, these kind of kids back. Do you kind of, I don't know, you're not starting from scratch, really. Oh, of course not. No, definitely not starting from scratch. Not at all. And those kids have been so awesome in terms of just taking me in and listening to what I have to say and working with me to build solutions. Um, I mean, Ben's had a couple offensive line coaches now. So, I mean, you know, he's a smart guy. He's a grown man. He's an experienced football player. So being able to work with a guy like that and, and build the plan that works best for our unit for this season has been awesome. And, of course, you know, the, the idea that it starts up front and having an experience back, not just experience, but productive and quality experience, I think everyone's excited about that. Hey, Coach. Um with the history that BC has producing offensive linemen, is that something that fuels you, or is it a little daunting? Or what? Is oh, it's it definitely like? not daunting. I'd rather have be that way than the other way. Yeah, I mean, when it turns, <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of things about this job that attracted me, but that was certainly one of them. You know, I mean, I went to the University of Connecticut. I'm from the Northeast. I know what this place is all about as it pertains specifically to offensive linemen, and that is that was a great draw for this job. No, that's not daunting at all. Coach, you've had stops at all different areas just to, around the country, different levels of football. Um, first off, how is bowl subdivision, um, you know, the power conference offensive line play need to be a little bit different than some of the other stops, even your last stop at Towson? Yeah. Um, and for you, what have you learned from just about the position from, from all the different areas? Of right. The regions? Um. It's a great question. I, I don't think there's anything that, that's necessarily inherently different to playing offensive line at FBS Power 5 versus FBS Group of 5 or FCS or, or whichever. I mean, I've worked at all the different levels, like you mentioned, and I'd say what it takes to be a good offensive lineman as it pertains to the Washington Redskins is the same thing at Boston College and the same thing at Davidson College. Now, I mean, the higher the level, maybe – you know, there's certain level of expectations in terms of uh, details and things like that. When I say that, though, I'm more talking about maybe the National Football League and the amount of time that you have with those guys. But at its core, playing offensive line, to me, I'm going to coach these guys in a very similar way that we coached them in the pros in a very similar way that I coached them last year at Towson. So I don't think that there's something that's that unique about playing off. Of course, the competition level is better, but it, in theory, our talent level is better, too. So to me, I, I don't think that there's a big difference there. And then um, in terms of things I've learned, at, at, um, I mean, I learn every year. I mean, that's, that's a goal of mine to grow every year, regardless of where I'm at. You know, um, when I was uh, with the Redskins my first two years, I worked for Joe Bugle. I mean, I, I don't know if you guys are familiar with him. I think you probably are. And um, he told me how at the time I was probably, geez, um, I was probably like 25 or something like that, you know. And he said, Matt, I've learned just as much between the ages of 68 and 69 than I learned when I was your age. And I just try to take that into my personal experiences, you know what I mean? And growing every year, you know, whether that's going out and studying people in the profession that I respect, uh, studying people in the profession that are doing great things, you know, whether that's technique, um, scheme, just pertain in big picture offense or offensive line play specifically. I just try to grow every year. So, I mean, I definitely like, for instance, I mean, there's, there's certain, certain stops I've made where I learned things that maybe I wouldn't have learned had I been at a higher level, let's say, you know what I mean? Uh, my experience in Southeastern Louisiana is a great example. I mean, I learned a lot about option play there that maybe some of the offenses I had been in before were more your pro style attacks where we dabbled in some of that stuff, but knowing the finer details of that stuff. I wouldn't have had that experience had I not gotten that job. So that's how I try to look at things. On the flip side, just looking at it, you know, most, if not all, of the coaches assembled here on the staff have NFL experience. And I was curious, one, how does that – what's the value of having so many guys who have at least had the experience of learning at the NFL level and, and, and being able to compete? And then how much does that put you guys sort of almost on the same wavelength a little bit? 
Yeah, I think there's a lot of value in having guys with NFL experience. One of the things I think that stands out when you have an opportunity to work in the NFL, if you're blessed with that opportunity to work in the NFL, is that you have to be a teacher. Do you know what I mean? And I think that's something that's unique to coaching at that level. Not that there's not people at other levels that coach in that way, but I think it is expected and demanded at that level because the players are grown men. The players are professionals of what they do. For a younger coach, by like my first runner and, and the Redskins, I'm younger than some of the players. So I'm not going to be able to go and yell at them, you know what I mean, and think that's coaching. I have to bring something to the table or they're not going to respect me. So I think working in the NFL brings that out of you. It demands that you are a master of your craft, that you bring something to the table of value, and that you know how to articulate yourself and teach. So, And I think that that carries over across all levels. And I'm not saying by any – there are high school coaches that coach that way. There are middle school coaches that coach that way. It's just – it's demanded at that level. So when you work at that level, I think it brings you into that, and then you can carry it kind of throughout the different jobs you may take. This is for me, but I think it's kind of funny that – there might be a perception that the yelling is what people consider coaching. Right. But if you go to like, I don't know, like a, if you watch like a USA basketball Olympic team or something like that, they are literally just explaining and yeah. talking and teaching. How much did, how quickly did you gather that that's actually well, what the process is? Yeah. Well, I mean, in the job that I had or the jobs that I've had at that level, had I gone out on the field and started yelling, that would have ended real quick. <laughs> and by ended, I mean like my employment. <laughs> so, um, so I mean, it didn't take me too long to figure out that I couldn't do that, you know, uh, nor would I have wanted to. But, um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, there's, and there's certainly a level of intensity that goes with football that maybe doesn't apply to other sports, you know. And you, you, see, you see yelling and hooting and hollering and pro football as well, you know. So it's not like that's not something that's going to happen here. <laughs> You know what I mean? People get frustrated or whatever it may be. It's less that much. It's less that part and more like you still have to get the idea across. Oh, yeah. Whether you yell it or you don't, you still have to get the actual. They have to know what they're doing. And it's your job to teach them that. You know what I mean? And uh, so, yeah, I, I think however that message is, is, is brought to them is, is, you know, that coach's unique style. I just I think that just something that's unique to pro football, in my opinion, is as a position coach or an assistant position coach or a quality control coach or whatever it may be, the quickest way to earn those men's respect is to be able to bring them something of value to help them maintain their employment. You coach Zion Johnson at, at Davidson. Coach. Yeah. Um, what, what did, how was he as a lineman for you there? And, and what made, uh, what maybe stuck out that when he, came to BC, you're like, he's going to, he's going to be pretty successful there. Yeah. I mean, well, a lot of things stand out about that kid. I mean, first off, he's just a quality guy. You know what I mean? Super quality guy. Um, I go back to the recruitment of him from the beginning. Uh, so me and Phil Troutwine were on the same staff at Davidson and I was the line coach. He was tight ends coach. He recruited Zion as that his, his local area. And I remember him telling me, like, I had this kid Zion, like, it's not even really worth watching his junior film. Like, we'll just get him to camp. I think you're going to like him. We have a very similar outlook on what we're looking for. And, um, yeah, I mean, he popped off the screen right away at camp. Now, at, at the time, he was probably, I don't know, like 235 pounds or something like that, you know. But, I mean, his arms, his arm like was incredible. His hands were huge. He had a size 18 size shoe. I mean, um, I remember I was making fun of him the other day about this. Like he, he ran, I forget the exact time, maybe a five flat or a five one forty or something like that. But he actually got into his stance like an lineman, which is hilarious. If you ever watch like combine training and you see all these guys getting their like super unique kind of like combine sprint, this guy just got in like a lineman stance and ripped off a five one with like no clue what he was doing. So like, you know, the uh, twitchiness, the athletic ability, it jumped off the page right off the bat. Uh, his, his stature, even though his weight wasn't there, you could see, okay, this guy, he's going he's gonna to grow into being a big guy. And then just going through the recruitment process with him, uh, meeting his mother, phenomenal person. You know, you just, you just fall in love with the kid, the family, and you're like, man, this guy's going to be awesome. So, you know, he showed up, and, um, I mean, geez, by the time he, we had him as a freshman, he was probably already like 265 or maybe 270 or something like that. And um, he tweaked his ankle in camp, so we didn't start him the first couple of games. But he, he was our most talented lineman right off the bat. He started the back eight games, let's call it, and uh, he played great for us. So, I mean, you know, I, I knew when he came here that he was going to be successful. I knew people probably would be like, hmm, 
transfer from Davidson. You know what I mean? But I knew it was going to work out for him because his work ethic is incredible. He's a bright guy. He's a great guy, and he's super, super gifted. So it doesn't surprise me at all that he's had a good run here. Yeah. Once you have one, one through five established, when you go to six to 12, are you looking for guys? Are you trying to teach multiple positions at that point? Like yeah. have tackles play guard, guards play center, stuff like that. With yeah. Those guys? So kind of, kind of my philosophy is I want to find just the five best linemen as a starting point. Like who are the five best guys? And then configure them to the fit their skill set best within the best five. Then, like you said, you know, I'd love to have 12 guys that can put in a game. But let's say you develop it to the point where you can get – eight guys in the game that you feel like, hey, man, the drop-off is, is insignificant. These guys can go in a game and, and do the job. Then as much as they can play multiple positions, the better because it allows us positional flexibility. It allows us to truly put the sixth best guy in the game as opposed to, well, this guy only plays left guard. So he's the sixth best lineman in the program, but if, the, if we have the tackle or center situation, he can't go in. You know, And then even within the starters, I'd like to build positional flexibility. You know, just because you're the starting right guard doesn't mean you couldn't possibly be the center, which would allow us to put in, in theory, the sixth best guy if the sixth best guy didn't have some of that positional flexibility. So, yeah, as much of that as we can build as possible. Now, you know, your established starters, how much are you going to be messing with their positions? I, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, you know, you don't want to become uncomfortable. But I think positional flexibility is a huge plus. It gives us flexibility. It, it makes the, the guys more um, – you know, prepared for potentially the next level. Um, I think that's a great thing to get done.